There is a word from the Lord this morning, and I do want you to get out before Labor Day. So let's start. Can I get a witness here? Amen. Somebody said, uh-oh. And I just bind up everybody to lift up your arm to look at your watch. In the name of Jesus, you're going to get a crook in your arm. So don't even look at the time. Amen. <laughs> Our scripture this morning is coming out of the book of Habakkuk. The first chapter, verses 1 through 5, and chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And this is the New King James Version. Are you with me this morning? I just thank God. Did I say, did I do the protocol right this morning? I'm a little off. Okay, I'm a little off with the protocol. But we just um, thank God for it. So, here it is. Habakkuk. I'm starting at verse 2, as a matter of fact. Oh, you got one up here? You go back to one. And the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. This is the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. And he said this. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear me. I even cry out to you and say there's violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law that you've given us, God, is powerless. And justice never goes forth. And the wicked surround the righteous. And therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Look unto the nations and watch and be utterly astounded, says the Lord. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe because I'm telling you this. Now let's jump over to the end. Now, though the fig tree may not blossom, may there may not be any fruit on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields may not yield any food, Though the flocks may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet, 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 I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. <laughs> The Lord is my strength, and, and he makes my feet like deer's feet so I can jump on the high places. Amen? Amen? This is for the chief musician and everybody who can hear the word of the Lord. Let the people of God say amen. 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 And if there were a, 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 a text or a, 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 a foundation, a launching pad, I'd like to use that verse that comes in the third chapter, round 17. And it says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And I want you all to pray with me this morning as I use the text and the tag against all odds. Thank you, Father, for your word that you sent us to heal us and deliver us and save us and guide us. Thank you for your word that does not go on and come back void, but prospers wherever you sent it, and you sent it to us. And it accomplishes everything you wanted to accomplish. So therefore, this morning, we say, let your will be done and let your kingdom come. Do something miraculous this morning for everybody under the sound of this message. Let the songs that they've heard, the prayers that have been prayed, the, 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 the announcements and everything that has been done so far be something that can go into changing somebody's life, to altering their course of history. Father, we want you to do something revolutionary. We want you to do something radical. We want you to set the captive free. We want you to bring your anointing so that those who've been mourning can dance and those who've had the, the 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 garment of heaviness can put on the spirit of praise oh god do it and if you can find a way to use me to be a part of that process i'd be so honored i just thank you god for using us because if the truth is told none of us are worthy but somehow you find some little 
iota of strength and hope in us, and you use us. So use me, God, as a vessel of honor to deliver your word so that somebody might be saved, somebody might be healed, somebody might be delivered, somebody might see their question marks turned into exclamation points, and somebody may see that you love us and you love them. Thank you, Lord. We count it done, and we celebrate the victory already. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I have a confession to make. One thing that I don't like when I hear preachers preach is when they spend a lot of time talking about themselves. I can't stand that. But I need you to forgive me this morning because I'm going to do something that I don't like, but I think it's going to make a point. Would you allow me to break my own rules right now in the name of Jesus and give me a makeup exam if I fail? But as I thought about this sermon, I, 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 I first thought about Tupac and his song about me against the world. And I just said, oh, that's a little bit too deep for me. And then for some reason, it was as if God took me in a, 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 in a time warp to the times when I was in college. Maybe it's because we had taken our children back to college and grandchildren back to college nowadays, but I went back to those days when I was in college. And this fresh, fresh freshman who didn't know too much about the H-Y-M in this, but who liked the H-I-M-S, hello, what can I say? And someone who had lived from a relatively sheltered life was now free, free black and 18. In the, in what year was it? In the 60s. Oh my God. In the middle of the revolution that started all the revolutions that's going on now. And so one of the things that I recognized was when I got to college was that I didn't have anybody to tell me to study. I didn't have anybody to tell me to go to class. But I did not know there was such a thing as the College of Card Games. And I immediately fell into that experience. Come on, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. And for someone who had never seen my parents uh, you know, doing uh, card games, although they may have been doing it, I didn't know it, I fell in love with Bid Whist and Double Deck Pinochle. <laughs> Can I tell you about that? I know you all are into spades and all those other things now, but in those days, for some reason, because we were in a PWI and we all only had time to be with ourselves, we would get around the table and pay, play those cards. And I played those cards, and I played those cards, and I played those cards. I ended up majoring in cards <laughs> and minoring in pool. Come on, what you say now? Put a little English on the stick. I know I wasn't saved all my life, but when God got me, he got me good. Now, I want you to know that was before. And one of the things I learned in cards was there's something that's called uh, the odds. The odds that may be against you or the odds that may be for you. What I didn't realize, however, was that the odds were connected to your knowledge or your skill and sometimes luck, but oftentimes the system that was governing the whole game. Are you with me right now? And oftentimes I would win and then I would lose because I never could focus on remembering all of the cards that had passed before me. Those of you who played cards before, if you're a good card player, you remember every card. It, is it, wait a minute, am I talking to myself? Was there anybody here played some cards that remember you had to see what number went before you? And so I never could do that, so I oftentimes get whipped. All right? And I just stopped because I stopped wanting to win anymore. I mean, stopped, I got tired of losing. And as we went on, I began to think about all the things in my life that had come up against me where the odds were against me. Not just in cards, but sometimes in being a black woman. And being a strong black woman. And being an educated black woman. And being a Holy Ghost on fire black woman who was free in the spirit. And a lot of places I would go, um, some would greet me, but then some would, would be hating on me. And I didn't know that. And so I would got to a place where I would begin to say, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't be in ministry because I don't fit in. It looks like the odds are against me. All of my friends get all of these opportunities to preach at all of these great places, and they don't even, I don't, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but they ain't even preach as good as I thought I was preaching. <laughs> Can I get a witness here? I mean, they had their special gifts and stuff, but I thought I was on their same level. 
But I realized it was because there was a spirit of ignorance that was over me because it wasn't necessarily about the gifts, but it was about where you stepped into and what the odds were against you. If the odds were for you, that was fine. Then I realized after a while, the odds didn't even matter from where I was going and what I was going to do. But odds were still in place for us as a people. The odds have been against us historically and culturally, economically. We could go through all of the leads and see that the odds were against us. So what does it mean when you talk about the odds being against you? That means that you're unlikely to succeed. It means that you don't have very much chance of succeeding. You're the last hired, first, fi last hired, first fired. Everywhere you go, they give you this, this lip service that you're going to be all right and it's going to be working. Not everybody's going to treat you equally and it doesn't work out like that. And then just up until recently, people began to think that they were going to have to leave the United States because of the spirit of the enemy working through Donald Trump was taking over the universe. That everybody was spending more time talking about all the things that he did that hurt us, that destroyed things, um, that pushed things back as if they forgot who God was. And, and, and you know, and I can hear people say, I'm going to move to Panama. I'm going out of the town. I'm going out to another place. I just can't stay here anymore. And I thought about that. It was that the odds are against us. Look at when, when somebody can commit all those felonies and still be allowed to run for president and somebody who is a felon can't vote. The odds are against you. There's no chance we're going to succeed. The days when we would all come together are over. Barack has come in. They've had their token. He's been the only one. There's not going to be anyone for a while. Mm, the odds look bad. And so it happens in life, in history, especially in biblical history. As we learn about this brother named Habakkuk, who lived around 626 BC. And if you know your Bible history was right between the, the fall of the northern kingdom, that where 10 of the tribes of Israel lived and settled, and the two tribes at the bottom, the top tribes had already given in and been conquered by the Assyrians. And so it looked as if now the next group of barbarians and militaristic forces were coming to destroy the southern kingdom where Jerusalem was. And Habakkuk was one of the prophets who would often see God. Now Habakkuk is not one of the, the major prophets by virtue of the fact that when we call them majors because of the amount of words that we see that was written not necessarily because of the content. Because if we look at Habakkuk, Habakkuk is a very major prophet because he was looking at God and asking God, how are we going to make it when the odds are against us? The 10 tribes of our brothers have already been defeated. It's only two of us here, and we are not the ones that have all the warriors. How are we going up against them? And so Habakkuk wrote this thing, and when you watch the prophets, if you ever study the prophets, the prophets really represent a type of dialogical literature. That means that there is some discussion and dialogue between God and the prophet. Because the prophets were the ones whom God could speak to to let them know what was going on. But oftentimes, God ain't say not damn thing to the prophets. And so here you have Habakkuk saying, God, what is going on? What is going on? And he begins to talk. In fact, he wrote this book because he wanted to know where God was. He wanted to know what God was doing. And he had several questions that I see many of us asking now. His first question was a question of God's timing. He said, God, how long are you going to take to answer my question? What's taking you so long to, to respond to me? And then the next question that we often ask is about God's purpose. Well, why are you doing all of this? Why are you letting evil take over us? Why are you allowing us to worry all the time? Why is it that the law you gave us is powerless? Why, why, why? And if it's not enough to, just, to, to check God on his timing and his purpose, then you got to go in for his identity. Woo! He said, God, are you not the rock? Are you not the one who's the fortress? He's questioning God's identity now. And then if that weren't enough, he said, hey, 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 why aren't you working things out the way I want you to work them out? Questioning God's methodology. We do that all the time. 
Why you do what you doing? When you gonna do what you need to do? Are you not the real God that has helped me in the past? Where are you now? And why aren't you doing it this way? And God said, hey, hey you boy. I'm just superimposing my thoughts on him. Go ahead. He said, listen, I don't know who you think you are. He said, but I am going to work a work which you may not believe. Every now and then after we finish our questioning, God will say, I know who I am. You may not know who I am, but I'm going to work a work that you will not believe. And then he says, because you don't trust me. When we don't trust God, we allow God to step back and not do anything. He said, because you don't trust me, you will not be able to see it until you start it. He said, yes, I'm letting these things come on you. What? You are letting these barbarians come against us? You are letting this injustice take place? You are letting the bondage and the inequality and the iniquities be the norm for those of us who you call your children? And God said, yes, I'm sending the bitter and nasty nation that's terrible and dreadful and they're going to come and destroy what you've been doing and then God lays out and said I want you to know this is going to happen he said because you've been disobedient because you have not believed me because you have not trusted me and because you have not trusted me I don't have an obligation to protect you I don't have an obligation to honor you I don't have an obligation to rescue you because you can't even believe in me longer than five minutes when you're in church. And so every now and then, when God answers our questions, what he does is causes us to shut up. And I really wish I was God wants us to shut up. And so the next thing we see in chapter 2 is Habakkuk has stopped challenging God and questioning God. And he says, hey, hey, God, I'm going back to my watch place. He said, I'm going back to my position. Sometimes you got to recognize that the way to get God to respond is to get back to where God has assigned you. He said, I'm going to go back to my position. I will stand and watch for you, God. I will get in position to hear from you. I will wait and watch to see what you will say, and I will be still, and I will listen. He said, I will listen to you, God. I will be still and listen. How many of us don't really listen to God? We just call on him all the time and tell him what we need and tell him what we want, but we don't stay still. He went back to his position. And the interesting thing about positions is God is a very strategic God. And God has a position for everyone who he calls by his name. Everyone he loves. We have a position, not a title, but a position. I'm not talking about titles. Titles are man-made or woman-made. But he says, I want you to get back in position. And position means that you're in a place to receive from God. Is your heart ready to receive from God? Is your mind ready to receive from God? Are you ready to hear from God? He said, I'm going to get back in my position because it must be something you want to say to me, God. He was a watchman on the wall. Ezekiel says a watchman has the possibility to look and see who's coming to destroy the children of Israel or the children of God. The watchman has to let them know if the enemy is coming. And if the enemy comes and the watchman doesn't alert the people that something is coming down the pike, that they're going to be in danger and they are killed or hurt or, 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 or destroyed, then the blood is on the watchman. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming, sees the stuff coming down the pike, and tells the people, and the people don't listen, and then they come under a scrutiny and come under destruction, then the blood is on the people. So he said, now I'm going to watch and see what's happening. I want to see what you have to say. Now, you all sitting kind of quiet. Is this making any sense to you? I need, some, I need somebody to say, I'm not sure. Just say, I'm not quite sure. Just keep on going. All right. So God said, listen to me. You need to write the vision. 
God always has a vision because God always has a promise. He always has a plan. And some of us don't take it seriously. He said that I will make you the head and not the tail. He said that I will lift you up. I will never leave you or forsake you. And they can come on you one way and they'll leave seven ways. God has promised to heal us. He's promised to deliver us. He's promised. He said, but write it down. We don't take time to write anything down. They used to say the best way to, to, to confuse black people is to put it in to ministers he wouldn't have called you if he didn't have something to say to you write it down it may be a song it may be a prayer it may be a poem it may be an, he said write it down in your journal write it down somewhere and this is what he said for the vision is yet for a point in time let me tell you one thing I know that God's promises are time stamped. Every promise God makes has a time on it. You didn't get what you wanted to get when you thought you needed it, but you got it when you needed it most of all. He didn't give you it at the time you wanted it because you wouldn't have been able to handle it. You would have messed it up. You would have, oh, come on now. Oh, glory. Let me keep on going. He said, though it tarries, wait for us. So if we have to have some points, Reverend Eric, for online people, all my online people. This is my first point. He said, though it tarries, wait for it. Do not tarry because it's going to come. Trust the process. Trust what God has been doing for millions of years and thousands of years since humans have been around. Trust what God is doing. Trust that God knows what God is doing. Trust that God knows who you are. Trust that God knows what you need. Trust that God knows when you're all by yourself and you need somebody to be with you, but you can't get anybody that time because you go the wrong way. Let me leave it alone. Trust the process. He said, because the just live by faith. The justified, the ones who receive the rewards, the ones who receive the blessings, do it because they trust God total trust. We can't tell you enough about trust. As Reverend Keisha preached last week, you got to trust God. No matter what is happening, you got to trust God. Trust the process. God knows what God is doing. Tell your neighbor, I think she's right. And then, who said that? Say it again. Thank you. <laughs> no, say God's right. You're all right, all right, all right. And as God began to unfold his plan, he said, listen, I got a plan for the wicked. Fret not over what you see the evil doing. Fret not over what you see those people who are not going to church, who are not praising God. Don't worry about them. I got a plan for them. They're not going to get away scot-free. It may look like they're getting away scot-free, but I got it. He said, woe to those who make profits by taking advantage of other people. Woe to those who cover and plan evil against others. Woe to the ones who build their towns on bloodshed. Woe to the ones who give poison to destroy the neighbors. And I can hear because saying, but God, have you seen the makeup of the military, of the Chaldeans? They are stronger. They are larger. They are mightier. They have more weapons. They have more soldiers. They have more experience. The odds are against us, God. How are we going to do that? Our backs are up against the wall. But somewhere along the line, Habakkuk must have remembered who God was. And instead, instead of stepping out, he said, God, what you want me to do? And God said, stay in the game. Stay in the game. Don't leave the game yet. It's not over. One of our problems is that we get so frustrated and we get so discouraged that we want to back out of the game before the last hand has been called. And he's saying, stay 
in the game. You who are trying to leave that job right now, stay in the game. You who are trying to leave that marriage, stay in the game. You who needs to, to find out who you are, keep on searching. Stay in the game. Stay in the game. Stay in the game. All the cards haven't come out yet. He got back in the game. And then he says, hold up. I just remembered. There's a lot of things that's been going on. I, I, verse chapter 3 says this. He says, I have heard your speech. God. I've heard you now. I've heard it. I've heard it. And I was scared. Sometimes when God tells us things, we're afraid. But he says, oh, God, revive your work. In the midst of all these years, in the midst of all the pain and all the struggle and all the suffering, I know somewhere along the line, he must have remembered what God can do when the odds are against God's people. Somewhere along the line, he must have remembered when the 11 brothers turned on Joseph to keep him down, but God elevated him from the pit to the palace. Somewhere along the line, he must have remembered when a small, meekly shepherd boy named David went up against the military giant Goliath and the Philistines and beat him with a slingshot and smooth. He must remember when Esther faced death and said, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to do what I got to do. And so he said, God, I want you to know that I'm with you. I've seen what you can do. I've seen the light of your arrows. I've seen you marching like an army. I've seen you taking care of the enemy. I've seen you going forth on, the be on behalf of the enemy. And then he takes a shift from just talking to God and praying to praising. That's when he gets to that last verse and he said, hey, God, everything is messed up here. I'm against all odds. We don't know what's happening. We don't know what's going on in our country. Everything is being depleted. And he said, though the fig tree may not blossom, figs representing the fruit, on their diet. The fruit may not be on the vines. Talking about the grapes that gave them a little vino to kind of mellow them out and give them a little kick. He said, those don't know fruit. There's no wine. There's no olive to cook our food in olive oil. There's no food in the fields. The flocks are gone and there's no herd in the stalks. He said, but yet I will rejoice in the Lord. All of a sudden, he got a defiant praise. He got a focused praise, a determined praise, and said, yes, I will rejoice in the Lord anyway. I just came here to tell about a hundred people that it's been against all odds that God could bring his people out of Egypt, out of Africa, out of slavery, out of Jim Crow, out of poverty, out of darkness, when God can turn the odds around because our justice systems are against us. Our school systems ignore our children. Our health systems focus on keeping people medicated and doped up. God wants us to know that he is there, but he said, don't get distracted by the drops of hope. We just came out of that DNC. That was one of the best ones we've ever been. We saw our cousins and we saw our friends. We heard them playing our music, and we saw somebody of our race, and our color, and our gender. Don't you think it's all over? Because everybody got her in place. Don't you think that the odds have switched? Those things don't switch. Woo! For some of us, and I'm almost finished. For some of us, nothing is working out. For some of us, it looks like every one step forward leads us three or four steps back. For some of us, it looks like the odds are against us and we've been dealt a bad hand and we can always remember that God is with us because God is an against the odds God. Look at this. It's against all odds that the world could be created out of nothing. It's against all odds that light can come out of darkness. It's against 
all odds that hope can come out of despair. It's against all odds that joy can come out of sorrow, that dancing can come out of mourning, that love can come out of hate. Like Habakkuk, we've got to be able to just go ahead and, and, and declare, even though we're the last hide and first fight, even though we've been neglected and rejected and ejected because of race and gender and age and size and class, we are still, my God, like God wants us to be. But I just got a word right now. I just got a vision. I saw one day that the devil was working the card table game. And it was a stacked death. And the devil was dealing from the bottom, using all the tricks of the trade that he could to bamboozle and hoodwink and beat all of God's people. But God decided that he was gonna get in the game. God decided to step out of glory and get in the game that the people couldn't win. And he humbled himself and became one of us. And he was bruised and abused and beaten and betrayed. But against all odds, he stayed in the game. Against all odds, he trusted God. And when it looked like he had had the worst hand of all his life, when it looked like he had been the worst round of all his existence, when it looked like he was abandoned and ridiculed and embarrassed, when he was hung on a cross to die, he even went into a cold bar team. And everybody knows that when you die on the cross, and if you don't die all the way, and they stick the sword in your side, and you bleed, that means it's all over, all over. The devil thought the game was all over. He said, I got this one. I had the odds against her. She should have died when she was in the hospital. She should have committed suicide when he left her. He should have jumped and gone to hell, but he's still saved. But God somehow got in the tomb. God said, I want you to know that I'm here. And even on the cross, Jesus said, they dealt me a bad hand, but God into your hand, into your hand. He said, I'm gonna put my hand in God's hand. Cause God hands always wins. He trusted God. He knew God's hands had created heaven and earth, had formed man and woman, had covered his people, had provided for his people. And that's why I have a cook and say, I know in whom I believe. Even though it's no food in the refrigerator, no gas in the car, no money in the bank, no, it's not there. I will rejoice in the Lord. And he held his hand. You gotta know when to hold them. You gotta know when to fold them. But you gotta know when to walk away. And somebody said early, early, early Sunday morning. I don't know how it happened, but somebody's hand pushed the stone away and folded up the napkin and put it in a good place and came out. Wait a minute. I feel a hermeneutical shift. Because no longer were the odds against him when God stepped out. I got a witness here. When God grabs your hand, when God grabs your heart, the odds shifted. And now the odds are against Satan. Because we fight, we win. We're more than conquerors. Can I get a witness? Anybody know what I'm talking about? God said, here I am. All power is in my hand. If you trust me, if you trust me, even in dark times and lonely times and hard times and struggles, 
God said, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Hold on. They just shifted. It just shifted. It's no longer what the enemy can do against you. Paul said, if God be for me, oh, oh, can I get about 20 people to stand up and say, if God be for me, who can be against me? Either way, I win. God's hand is the right hand. Hold up. I forgot my last point. I said I wasn't going downstairs because my leg was still hurting. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh-huh, 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 devil, this one is for you, bam! I came by to tell you, not only to trust the process, not only to stay in the game, not only not to be frustrated, but one thing I've seen from watching the games on TV, the house always wins. The house always wins. And in his house are many mansions. He gave us the house. We are the house of the holy temple. What you said, Satan, you can't be. Hold up. I'm going to tell on my husband today. Since he been retired, he watches poker. And I never understood poker because that was a little too complex for my double deck pinochle, bid with mine. But I would sit with him, trying to be the nice wifey. You know what I mean? And I'd tell him, well, what's the highest card? I said, is it four of a kind? He said, no. Is it all aces? He said, no. He said, it's called a royal flush and a royal flush I know y'all here a royal flush is when you have the ace the king come on I know y'all holy listen cause we holy don't mean we don't know things in one suit I believe that in the tomb that day on resurrection Sunday the Father, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Son of Man, the Holy Ghost got together and had a divine, supreme, supernatural, ultimate, royal flush. That's why I said we are children of the Most High God. That's why I said we are born with golden spoons. That's why it says that God is great in us. Can I get a witness right now? I don't know what's in your hand, but I lift my hands to the Lord. From whence come my help? I lift my hands in total praise. Can I get a witness? Can you praise him right now? Has he dealt you a great hand? Have you made it when you thought you were going to lose it? Have you ever come through when everybody counted you out? Have you ever? I need you to praise him right now. I need you to thank him. I need you to let him know that the odds are in my favor. The odds are in my favor. The odds are in my favor. Repeat it after me. The odds are in my favor. The odds are in my favor. Because God is in my favor. How many months was she in the hospital? Three months. 83 days. Come here, baby. They didn't think she would live. Her heart was 
thought the enemy thought that the odds were against her. But what you want to say? Are you glad you're still alive? Yeah. I'm glad. I'm really glad. I'm really, really glad. Yeah. Really glad. It is no secret what God can do. Thank you, sis. You can sit down, Jordan. And of course, I've got to tell you my story, then I'm gone. Y'all know about the heart attack. And they took and took care of it. And then I was okay. And they put me in a room. And the next day I was supposed to go home. And I was asleep. Now I want you to know that where my blockage was, was in what they call the widow's maker. That only 5% of people who have a blockage in the widow maker, which feeds the whole bottom of your body, lives. Only 5%. So I said, okay. I defied the odds. Go ahead, God. But then God said, wait a minute. On that third day, you died in your room. So you didn't make the odds. The odds were against you and you died. He said, but sometime that day, I switched the deal on you. Sometime during the night uh, while you were sleeping, while you didn't even know what was going on, got you up again. I just want you to know whatever report that you've gotten, God can turn it around.